I never got to know my grandfather, Charles Myers, because he died in 1981. He said, Barbara, if anything happens to me, I want you to check in on me. And I said, what? He said, uh, you heard me. I remember your grandfather. I knew him personally. And this is what I've been having to deal with. It's embedded in my brain now for 37 years now. Longest day of my life. Who's to blame? I'm not going to point no fingers at nobody. I'm not going to blame the boy that lit the cigarette lighter. I'm not going to blame the man that okayed the ventilation system. I'm not going to blame the foreman that didn't evacuate the mines. A lot of things could have been done a whole lot better that day. When the explosion happened at Mine 21, that was the beginning of the end. I'm Kelsey Arbuckle. I'm a student here at Swanee, the University of the South, and I am from Grundy County, Tennessee. Grundy County is very close in proximity to Swanee, um, about a 15 minute drive. Swanee and Grundy County are so close in proximity, but so starkly different in culture and economic status. Most of the university employees at the dining hall and that clean the dorm rooms and stuff are from Grundy County. My grandmother's name is Barbara Myers, and she works at the university dining hall in the bakery for about 25 years. My whole family calls Barbara Nana. My grandfather died way before I was ever even thought about, and I had never asked any questions. My family had just never talked about it. I guess it was easier to just not. I'm going to Grundy County to visit with my mother and my grandmother. I need to know more about the story. Tell me about my grandfather. He was a very hardworking man and he loved his children. He liked to play. He was just funny, and he always took care of his kids first. I knew he would really take care of us no matter what. He was just a good person. And of course, I loved him. And uh, Charlie started working in the coal mines in 75. And he worked there till December the 8th of 81. Charlie didn't come home from work, and uh, so I called out there, and I don't remember who I talked to, but he said, I asked him, was Charlie okay? And he said, he's, he's fine. I said, are you sure? He said, he's okay. When Charlie's brother got there, was then we decided to go out the mine. I went inside and and that's when they said he was dead. And that was it. Thirteen people in a small community, it affected everybody. Not only was your grandfather killed, but 12 other men who also had kids and grandkids. I want to make sure that their grandfathers and their dads are remembered for the hardworking men that they were. Do you like feel like you know more about your grandfather now? Like I cried for a little while just because seeing my mom and my nana get emotional, it just like all came together. This is my um, grandfather, yeah. Charlie Myers. I am one of very few Grundy County students at the university, and Alexa Fultz is one of the other very few. 
Alexa also has um, a strong family tie with coal mining. My great, 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 great grand uncle, he was the first person to discover coal on the plateau. I got to looking through all of like the archives and whatnot and all of our family history stuff. The coal mining industry was the main industry that we had here. Everything was related to the coal mining industry. Everyone was a coal miner or worked in the company in some form or fashion or their income that they lived off of came from the company. When that all goes away, you're left with no way to, to move on because you don't have this income that has always existed and it doesn't exist anymore. Alexa and I needed to know more, so we reached out to an expert on American labor history. The boom of the Southern Appalachian coal economy, which really explodes after the 1880s and 1890s, really utterly transforms the region in, in all sorts of ways. Coal becomes this essential natural resource for the manufacturing economy of the late 19th and early 20th century. America, industrial miracle of the century. Coal, and plenty of it, is purchased to keep the far-flung factories going. It's where Grundy County fits into a national economic picture that encompasses Detroit and Cleveland and all these major industrial centers outside of the region. From your perspective, what happens when the coal mining industry dies and the company leaves town? Yeah, well, I mean, there's only so much coal under the ground, right? And those coal companies are only invested in those places until there's no more coal to dig up. Throughout the 20th century, local economies like Grundy County are going through it, that process sort of constantly. Coal is discovered becomes a major source of economic activity, is overproduced, there's no coal left, the jobs disappear. The disappearance of that can have really devastating effects on communities. We're going to a coal museum in Whitwell, Tennessee to talk with some coal miners that knew my grandfather and worked in Mine 21. Well, good afternoon. My name is J.T. Shadrick, and I, of course, I'm with the Whitwell Coal Miners Museum. There is many of articles in here that came from Mine 21. Mine 21 was the largest mines that we had. They told us when we hired in, you buy your houses, you buy your Cadillacs, we're going to make you rich. Each year, the company had a picnic, barbecue, all the food you want, games for the children, give away prizes. I mean, that was something that everybody looked forward to. Everybody came. We had real good lives. December the 8th, 12 o'clock. My ears pop. Power went off. A few minutes later, somebody come running up to the face. Why is that? I think there's been maybe an explosion or a fall. I said, you need to evacuate the mines immediately. The 1981 explosion that killed 13 coal miners in Tennessee was caused by methane gas, which should have been detected and removed from the mine. Methane is a gas that you don't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it. So actually, you don't know you're in methane. Here was an open area back here. Methane was accumulating in this place. So when he drilled into it, they were in a high percentage of methane. And at that time there, they closed the hole back up. They was a picking this methane up, a ventilating this old section over here. They didn't tell the rest of the mines what they were going to do. And they didn't know what was going on. Cigarette lighters, matches, Flammable stuff like that is not allowed underground. It is against the law to have them, but this man had them. And when he lived this, he lived that method. When it got to that point there, boom, it exploded. Mine rescue team went under mask and 
started crawling there, taking each section at a time. And I looked out and I saw timbers and that's when I realized this is for real. First thing we do, we found two men away from everybody else by themselves and there all the other ones were in one section and uh, it was immediately known that, you know, they were dead, there was no hope. Here, Jim and I are back the next day, you know, and we're picking up rock dust samples. They want to get it analyzed. And, uh, and if you can just imagine, it came out, it was 3,300 degrees in there. A lot of the rescue workers that went in there, I mean, they had a hard time dealing with that, getting those bodies out. Longest day of my life. It was a war zone. I knew all of them personally. Personally, name, families, children. I knew them personally. And when we come out of the mines, then we brought the bodies out. They were ambulances. They were news people there. And I got to go home. You get home, you take a shower, and, and there's no sleep for you. I, I mean, you, you can, the smell, you can still smell it. Uh, working with a federal, you know, I mean, you go to a lot of accidents where people have gotten killed. You don't get used to seeing people get killed. You, you get to where you can put up with it. They wanted to put out the news that people were rich. This is what caused so much trouble. Mm -hmm. That was not the story, but that's what they wanted told. Then it started off being $650 a month and no insurance. But uh, my kids couldn't live without food and we couldn't live without transportation. And they had to go to school and they had to go eat and uh, we had to pay electric bills. and. If I could have put my kids in a bubble and me too and lived for 80 years without spending a penny, then we might have had that million dollars. What happened after the local lawsuits were settled? We sued the federal government. Families of the dead miners are now suing the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA, for negligence. The mine should have been dangered off because methane into the bleeder system had been detected at least four days preceding the explosion. So you're, you're saying that the agency itself was a negligent? That's right. Is that right? If they had been laid that mine like it was supposed to, then it wouldn't have exploded and killed Charlie. A lot of things were uncovered that people did that shouldn't be done, like okay in that ventilation system. I think it could have been prevented is what I'm saying. And when we were asked to come to that Senate hearing, then I said, okay. One by one, current and former mine safety officials testified about finding major safety violations in coal mines and being forced by their bosses to ignore the problems. When mine safety officials proposed tougher safety regulations, they say they were overruled by higher ups in Washington. That many of the provisions provide less safety than the experts recommended. Known for a long time how to prevent many of the deaths in the mines. What we seem to have lost lately is the will to do what good judgment and the law require. Is it uh, your belief that the accident itself could have been avoided? Yes, I do. I was like, my Nana was testifying with the Kennedys in Washington, D.C., and I never knew this. I was there because I thought mine in laws, not that they should be changed, they should have just been enforced. The Senate Labor Committee hearing was called to show a pattern in the Mine Safety and Health Administration, a pattern which the chairman called shameful and tragic. To be a woman in the 80s testifying in the Senate was, I mean, a pretty big deal. It would still be a big deal, but that's not this documentary. The senators will hear next from leaders of the miners' union, followed by the mine owners, 
and the government officials who were charged with caving in to the owner's demands. John Holloman, CNN Capitol Hill. I wouldn't have had the courage to keep standing up, and she did. In my opinion, it took a lawsuit to make sure that things changed. American labor history, American economic history is defined by mining explosions, railroad workers being crushed to death between rail cars, textile factories going up in flames with locked doors. And the only thing historically which has forced employers to spend more to protect the health and safety of their workforce has typically been workers, miners, railroad workers, steel mill workers, textile factory workers, organizing to demand, in addition to higher pay and other kinds of things, better working conditions. And when workers do that, the government has historically followed. How effective those government agencies have been waxes and wanes, right? But the reason they exist has only been because people or their re elected representatives have compelled them to. We wanted to know more specifically about safety regulations in coal mines. So we went to speak with some experts in the field. When you look at mine health and safety regulations, um, typically they have been reactive as opposed to proactive. You know, the bottom line, any any time there is a change in, in, in regulation, legislation, etc., you know, which always has been said, mine health and safety regulations are written in the blood of those who died. We found this archival footage of my Nana testifying at this congressional hearing about coal mine safety. And I thought it was like such an honor that she got invited, but she wasn't there to get honored. She wanted to fight for what was right. So I just wanted to know, when people like my grandmother get called to congressional hearings, are the people in power really paying attention to them? There was no immediate um, regulation or change in the laws, but I think that it woke people in the industry up. The testimony your grandmother gave, um, yeah, that was a building block to saving lives in the future, absolutely. I believe she made a difference, no question about that. My grandfather told my Nana, if anything happens to me, I want you to check in on it. And she spent over a decade of her life checking in on it. My grandma and her legal team pursued federal lawsuits, but ultimately they were denied the ability to sue the federal government by the federal court system, despite the overwhelming evidence of negligence on the part of MSHA that was uncovered during the Senate hearings in 1987. Even when we were in high school, they were people who would say, our parents don't have jobs around here anymore because your mom's lawsuit. The mines left here because of your mom's lawsuit. Even in a natural disaster, people look for something to blame or something to focus on that would explain what's happening to them. To cast blame is really to look for a reason, a reason something happened. We wanted to know what really caused the mines to shut down. So we traveled to one of the last places where you can see evidence that there was once a booming coal industry. This area is above mine 21. Why did the mines close is a very good question. The depressed market, losing the Japanese contract, I think was um, one of the major things. It was something that was eventually going to happen, you know. When you go outside the building, you don't hear anything but birds. Uh, and, and, you know, you come to the realization that it's over with. Uh, uh, a great dynasty uh, is over with that supported the community, and that was good for the people. Uh, and it, it's sad. It, it's... Uh, you hate to see it go. Everybody has adapted and moved on. We're currently getting ready to start the last demolition of the preparation plan. That's the last site that we like. 
Everything you see here except for the two brick buildings will be gone. It'll be all vegetated and look like one big field. Well, it's just, uh, just hard to see it go. And the memories. My grandfather started. I get the pictures. We've learned that throughout history, communities across the U.S. have gone through tragedies like Mine 21 or the loss of an entire economy. We want to know what is being done today to help people heal from these kinds of traumas. Post-traumatic stress, we know what this is. I think companies and the government need to work hand in hand. That when you have these kinds of events, immediately you get these people who have been on the front lines into a regimen to help them through this. They should arrange for mental health counseling. They needed counseling then and they need follow-up, and they didn't get it. This is what I've been having to deal with. It's embedded in my brain now for 37 years now. I think the more people are encouraged to push something underground and not speak at all, that silence becomes traumatic. We think that one of the most important things is having a very tight social network that is truly supportive and where you truly feel understood. This is the way we would think of the intergenerational transmission of, of trauma is somebody in a subsequent generation is sent on a mission to do a piece of work on behalf of the whole community. And I think that's what the two of you are doing. You have been sent probably unconsciously on a mission to heal something in the community, in yourselves, in your family, around this horrible betrayal, really. This is what younger generations do for older generations at times. Nana has inspired me to want to pursue a career in public policy. If she can still believe in the government after everything she's been through, then I want to be someone who can help people like her in the future. You know, we want to take the past and learn from it. The past two years of working on this project, you know, I've kept a collection of pieces of coal because it is a connection to the things that my ancestors did and the history that, you know, resulted in my existence. And I think that it's important to collect that and record it and remember it. When people are silent, we don't know that they're hurting. If you really believe in something and you really want to fight for something, you're gonna have to share your story. All the news articles I've read and like the Wikipedia page and everything else is just focusing on like statistics. We've been looking at people's lives. Yeah. And I think that's the angle that this was missing mm -hmm. before. guys that worked at the coal mines there, uh, especially 21, I was very familiar with, you know, uh, in just an instance, friendship can be taken away from you from people that you've known all your life. And so I wrote this little song uh, about the disaster there. Picked up his lunch, starts for the door. Kisses his sweet wife goodbye, but he had many times before. He starts off the work, not knowing what's coming his way. 
trouble down in mind 21 You won't be coming home today Now he's a coal mining man Trying to get by Little does he know that today It'll cost him his life that coal mine now you won't hear a sound but if you listen real close you might hear the ghost of 13 coal mining men if you listen real close you might hear the ghost of 13 coal mining